My book opens with a simple question. Can you buy a Big Mac in Tunisia? McDonald's has been trying to enter the country for a long time, but it was persistently prevented by the government of the old powerful president, Ben Ali. Why? They didn't partner with the right local distributor, meaning a company under Ben Ali's protection. This is a typical story of Ben Ali's 24-year-long reign over Tunisia. By the time he was overthrown from power during the Arab Spring in 2011, his family's wealth was estimated to be about one quarter of the country's GDP. Not only that, but his family had direct ownership in about 220 domestic firms. And I'm talking about the biggest firms, telecoms, banks, transportation, distribution, real estate, hotels. These were the right companies to do business in Tunisia. What he did was very simple. Barriers to entry for all competitors and monopoly prices for his companies. What did the people get? Higher prices for all goods and services, lack of employment opportunities for anyone not connected to the family, and naturally higher income and wealth inequality. This is how collusion between politics and business looks like. Ben Ali's Tunisia is just a drop in the bucket of all such similar stories. Have you heard, for example, of the Italian Tangentopoli affair, uncovered by Manu Pulite, the clean hands investigation? In the 1990s, half of the country's member of parliament, members of parliament and local government officials got indicted on corruption charges. This effectively brought an end to the 50 years of political dominance of the Christian Democrat Party. Corruption was institutionalized. A kickback, or tangente, was considered a standard business expense for any company that wanted to do a job with the government. You can find identical stories of political capture where the government is the main source of corruption, from Suharto's Indonesia, to Fujimori's Peru, to Putin's Russia. Same logic, same negative social outcomes. But it's not just politicians that are the pulling factor. Very often, it's the companies themselves who create systemic corruption. For example, the Odebrecht scandal in Brazil and throughout South, South America. This company built a corruption machine. It was uncovered it paid over $800 million in bribes across South America. They were getting large construction contracts, and then they used shell firms and secret bank accounts and fake invoicing to extract money to give out for bribes. They funded several presidential campaigns and hundreds of legislators in each country they did business in. Another good example is the one IMDB scandal in Malaysia. That company was officially structured as a sovereign development fund, but through which Joe Lowe, a shady Malaysian businessman with ties spanning from Middle Eastern royal families to Hollywood, his company, by the way, produced the movie Wolf of Wall Street starring Leonardo DiCaprio, literally funneled billions of dollars from the company to himself and the then Prime Minister Najib Razak. Also involved was the Asian branch of Goldman Sachs, which made over $600 million in fees but whose senior employees later faced embezzlement charges. So many other examples exist. Just remember how many banks got caught up as being complacent in money laundering schemes involving even the funding of terrorist activities or drug cartels. Whether the pooling factor comes from politics or from business, the outcomes are the same. That's why my argument is that there isn't much of a difference in the logic of power between a despotic ruler and a kleptocracy or a democratic ruler and the interest groups surrounding them. There's obviously a difference in outcomes, right? In democracies, free media or special police investiga investigations uncover scandals and an independent judiciary sends people to prison. But the logic is no doubt the same. My favorite example of elite network collusion actually comes from the United States, 19th century New York to be exact, the Democratic Party Tammany Hall political machine. William the Boss Tweed was its most prominent leader and vastly considered the most powerful man in the city during the Robert Barron era. He was a large landowner in the city, he had a ra railroad company, a bank, a printing press, and a hotel. But most of his power came through controlling all political outcomes in the city, not as mayor, but as the person who decides who gets to be mayor. It was business and politics merged into one. Ah, but that was way back then. Things are much better now. Well, think again. 2014, Robert Rizzo, a city manager of a small town Bell in California with a population of only 30,000 people, was arrested after being uncovered that he paid himself almost $800,000 in annual salary, which is, by the way, twice that of the U.S. president. The model was similar. Misappropriation of public resources for himself and his cronies. A similar case was Ron Blagojevich, the Illinois governor, sentenced to 14 years in prison. But these are just the politicians, and their transgressions are actually rather small when compared to some of the frauds committed in corporate America. Consider the cases of Elizabeth Holmes and Sam Bankman-Fried. Each was a case in point of how unicorn startups offering 
world-changing solutions got caught up in their own fake it till you make it mindset and ended up hurting not only their investors, but also defrauding their customers and landing both of them in prison. Also in common was how they got there, elite network, corporate, and political connections. Holmes had filled her board with two former secretaries of state, Joel Schultz and Henry Kissinger, in addition to former senators, generals, and cabinet ministers. These connections in particular helped her secure huge VC funding and good business deals. As for Sam Bankman Fried, he often boasted that he was the second biggest donor for the Democratic Party, using his parents' political connections to successfully navigate the VC investor field. And finally, my second favorite example of elite network collusion, Bernie Madoff. His product was a pyramid scheme from the very beginning. He avoided prosecution for years, even when the signs were clear. When the Securities and Exchange Commission, the U.S. stock market regulator, was opening an investigation against him, he didn't have to lobby or bribe anyone. All he did was make a phone call to the chairperson of the SEC, his friend, and politely question why they were even investigating him. This effectively ended the investigation. His scheme was not exposed by the regulators, but by the markets. In 2008 crisis, had many people pulling out their money, and the jig was up. So, not that big of a difference between the spotty kleptocrats on one hand and well-adown democracies, is there? I mean, again, of course there is. But as I said, the logic of power and behavior of elite networks is always the same. That's the whole point of elite networks. Stick around and subscribe. Happy to show you more interesting examples.